Hey, what's going on, guys? We'll give you guys a chance to come into, into the live stream, into the conversation, and uh, uh, take your time and get comfortable here. Uh, and uh, we will begin uh, the podcast in one moment here. What's going on, guys? What's happening? I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from Your Black World and the Black Business School. And uh, I'm going to give you guys a chance to settle into the conversation. I want to say welcome, everybody, to drboycetv.com. This is the home for intelligent black people. And I see T. Hill and uh, Flash is Fresh uh, TV is in here. And Legends of Sleepy Hollow and Bridget Thomas. How, how are you doing? Uh, from Oakland. Uh, shout out the city that you're from. Shout out what city that you're in. I want to say hello to everybody on Instagram. Instagram is the real Boyce Watkins. And uh, I want to warn everybody in, in advance that my food, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky for the Diverse Entrepreneurship Summit, and my room service food is on its way, and they're going to knock on the door at any moment. And just so y'all know, I'm going to interrupt this conversation to go get my food. Uh, so, but, but fortunately, I've got some backup here to, uh, to cover, to cover the, the situation uh, while I grab my food is uh, Dr. Rick Wallace. Uh, Rick is... Um, uh, he's a uh, he's a psychotherapist, from what I understand. He or he's psychology is his thing. He understands uh, uh, a lot about uh, the mind and and how it affects black people. And he's very interested in the black community. And he's a very smart brother. And I'm very very happy to have him. He's also coming to speak at the All Black National Convention uh, this year. And so uh, I would like to uh, welcome my brother uh, Rick Wallace. How are you doing today, man? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yes, I'm glad to have you. Glad to have you. Um, now uh, let me shout. I'm shouting a couple of your cities before we get started. Let us know what city you're from. I see Legends of Sleepy Hollow from Brooklyn, uh, Charles from Phoenix, uh, okay, Joan from Vietnam. Wow, that's, I don't think we have a lot of people from Vietnam to come through. We've had, uh, you know, places like Pakistan and, and and parts of China and stuff like that. But Vietnam, I haven't seen a Vietnam in a while. Uh, Bridget, uh, how you doing? Uh, T. Hill from Washington, D.C. Good to see everybody. I see uh, Dwinell from Haiti, uh, Casey from Cleveland. Uh, let's see, I see Peterson, Detroit. Um, what else? Dallas, uh, sh from Chicago in Los Angeles, but also went to Moore High School in Louisville. Okay, so you from the bill. Great. Well, uh, too bad if you were here, I'd invite you to the uh, Diverse Entrepreneurship Summit. If anybody wants to come see us uh, today, you can go to drboyslouisville.com. And also, if you want to see Rick uh, do his thing at the All Black National Convention, along with many, many other great people, go to allblacknationalconvention.com. Everybody, please hit the thumbs up button, share and subscribe button, and uh, let's get this conversation started. Uh, I want to, uh, I, Rick uh, actually um, had some interesting things to say about Malik Yoba. Uh, did anybody, yes or no, give me a yes or no, did anybody see uh, the, the, the whole thing with Malik Yoba? Are you familiar with him? Uh, I assume everybody knows New York Undercover. If you've never, I never really watched the show, but I do know of the show. And I was actually, I was actually gonna work on a project with Malik at one point. He just never came through. But uh, is, is everybody familiar with what's going on with, with, you know, in terms of him, you know, talking about being interested in transsexual women, and and a lot of people kind of thought that was a little bit interesting that he was sort of doing this public confession, and then it became even more dramatic. Uh, and uh, so uh, Rick has some interesting perspectives on it. And I would like to, uh, while while I grab my food because they just knocked at the door, I would like Rick, could you begin the discussion for us on, uh, you know, Malik Yoba and sort of your perspective on what you're sort of seeing here? Sure. Uh, first of all, what I want to do is 
just introduced the way that I approach dealing with things. I was just ex explaining to Dr. Watkins that I don't focus on personal opinion, including my own. I look at the Black collective as a whole and I look at everything that I do or say or address is based on how it impacts the Black collective because personal ideas, personal concepts, personal philosophies will sometimes move away from what needs to be a unified idea or agenda. And that's okay because people are individuals. The second thing that I wanna clarify is I don't attack people. I address concepts, ideas, and philosophies. Uh, everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to make their own uh, personal decisions. I talk about it. Uh, one of the things that uh, is noted on my channel uh, on YouTube is that I don't like to be uh, asked questions that pulls me into ongoing conflict between my brothers and sisters who are out trying to make an impact. I'll talk about a behavior. I'll talk about an idea, but I don't get drawn into that because I don't believe it helps. Uh, with that being said, with Malik Yoba saying that he's trans attracted, first of all, listening to the morning show interview, uh, there are a couple of things I noticed. Number one is he admits that it was a calculated move. So that lets you know that there are uh, underlying motives or uh, ulterior motives to doing it. It wasn't just a coming out idea that there are some things that follows. And they mentioned those things like a big event that's happening at the end of this month uh, that they were trying to bring attention and conversation to. But it also points out some, some, some things that I've talked about, written about, spoken about uh, for years now. And it's, it starts with uh, the LGBTQ community. And from what I understand by watching that interview, they've added a couple of more letters that I haven't had time to familiarize myself with. And I'm not gonna even try to address that right now. What I wanna address real quickly is in listening to this interview, the first blaring uh, observation I was able to make with the exception of the word trans, the next most commonly used word that's not uh, an, uh, a definitive article or something like that, but an actually descriptive word is trauma. So, and that's something that has been prevalent in any research that's, that is done in my dealings. And, and the thing is, I deal with the homosexual or gay community or the LGBT community now to make sure I don't want to leave anybody out because I, I get blasted by them at least once a month. So uh, I work with them directly. I've had a roommate uh, who was openly gay. Uh, and so there's no hatred. Uh, there's no fear. They, use, they, they love to tag people who disagree with something as being homophobic. I, I don't have a phobia. As a matter of fact, I have a strong love for all my brothers and sisters, despite what their orientations are, their gender identity. That doesn't matter to me. I'm about blackness. I'm a black man before I'm anything else. I'm a black man, a black husband, a black father, a black business owner. Uh, so I love black. But the thing that I've noticed in dealing with the community on my own is that is a, a highly pervasive common cord, which is trauma, predominantly in childhood, which is also recognized and known as adverse childhood experiences. And those have magnificently powerful impacts on our behavior as adults. So I don't want to say just because they have trauma in their lives that that's the the common thread that's causing them to identify as they're identifying. Because anybody who understands research and understands studies and understands other, there are other variables. And even in highly controlled, controlled groups, you still have these variances that you have to make, uh, uh, give allowance for. What I'm saying is you can't ignore it. You can't ignore that trauma is almost always present. And it's al almost always sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first thing that blared out to me was there's this talk about trauma. Every person in the room admitted that it happened, including Malik, saying starting at age seven was the first time. I think it said again at age 13, and then at 15, he was stabbed, and some other things happened, and then he was kicked out of the house at 16. And then he, uh, at 19, he had his first encounter with a, as he put it, trans woman. And the, the other thing, and then I'm, I'll turn it back over and see if there are any questions. The other thing that really stood out to me was their forceful intent to introduce a new vernacular, a new set of terminology to define certain statuses, identities, behaviors. And anytime, in, if you want to control the people, control the vernacular. Because as you shift vernaculars, 
you also shift parameters on how things are viewed. You know, uh, and that's why, you know, I believe a lot of what we have right now, one of the things we don't have that other immigrants have is their native language. And that impacts us psychologically, but also introducing a new language, it redefines the parameters of what's acceptable and not acceptable. You know, uh, what's gay now isn't gay. Like for instance, one of the things they said that can be confusing if you don't take time to really break it down. And what will happen is most people who are, uh, and I hate to use this term, but intellectually lazy, meaning that I don't want to figure this out. I'm just going to take your word at it type people. Uh, and that's what the media counts on is I'm going to think for you and I'm going to give you a perspective. And that's the perspective you're going to judge everything on. Well, what happens is when someone says, well, we actually have trans women, meaning a man who is now identifying as a woman who sleeps with women. So now you have a trans man who's identifying as trans lesbian. And so we're going to cloud the waters with that. And again, my thing is <laughs> more on... <laughs> More on, but I'm, I'm, I'm listening to, and I'm going like, there are all these different new things. And, and every time somebody spoke, they were corrected if they weren't using the proper terminology. And so my, my, fo my focus in looking at, at that is twofold. Number one is, I don't want to minimize the reality of what's going on. There are transgendered people being murdered. Uh, but th that's something else I noticed. I noticed that when it was brought up that some people believe the reason that transgender people are being murdered is for this thing called stealthing. Stealthing is when you move in on a guy as a transgendered woman and don't identify yourself as such and present yourself as what they call cis women. They, it's no longer, if you are a natural woman who identifies with your gender assignment that you've had since birth, that's on your birth certificate, you're not just a woman now, you're a cis woman. Again, the changing of terminology. So now trans woman doesn't sound as bad. Well, let me inter let me jump in and ask you this, uh, Rick. So cis, I've seen that word cis a lot. It's a sign, it's a, uh, it's a uh, genetic scientific terms that means on the same side. It means the same. So in other words, you haven't shifted. So okay. uh, you okay. have cis, cis so men. I, I'm a cis man. According to the new terminology and the way they're using it, you, you would be a cis man, I would be a cis man, and anybody that's actually changed their gender but from what their original assignment was would be a trans at some form and shape. And they look at trans from the person who first identifies and still looks like a man all the way until uh, gen uh, gen uh, uh, gen uh, genital reassignment. So all of that is trans, and then there are the different valuables. What I do want to uh, put in is I don't want to minimize the reality of what those people go through. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here to tell them to change. What I'm saying is if you don't know and you're not 100% certain and aware and have an understanding of what you're going through and why, then your reality isn't real. That's my thing. Now, if you get treatment and you heal, for everyone that's dealing with sexual trauma, and I'm not just talking about transgender gay people. I'm talking about anything that you're dealing with in life right now. If you haven't dealt with the trauma in your past, that trauma is impacting how you're moving through life and you're not getting the full uh, experience of life. You're not truly living. So my thing is, if you go through counseling, not to change how you feel about your gender, not to change how you feel about your sex, but to understand who you are and you go through this healing process and you experience that and you decide, you know what, I still want to be that power to you, more power to you. Um, my, my thing and my concern is it's being so pervasively pushed as an agenda and anyone who doesn't agree with it is immediately attacked to the point that they're making it a politically correct idea or concept and now they're putting it in front of children and we all understand that at a certain age, children are absorbing all the way up to maybe five or seven years old they're in a state of theta where they're just absorbing life and understanding what the parameters are, how I'm going to live through life, what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. And you're introducing a new idea to them. And yeah, they're going to jump on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a concern of mine. So, but, but I don't want to sit up and say, you know, I have no feelings. Like I say, I've worked with a number of people. I have more than a couple of people in my family who are part of that community. And I talk to them all the time. I talk to my former roommate all the time. We're still friends. 
uh, I'm not judging you because of your lifestyle, but if you ask me, and all my friends know, if I don't want him to tell me how he feels, don't ask him, because I'm not with you to talk about your sexuality or your gender uh, identity. I'm here to- let me, let, me, let me jump in and say this, though. I'm gonna tell you this, man. I think that um, no matter what you say right now, no matter what you say right now- Oh, they gonna come for me. Yeah, they gonna come for you. Like, like yeah. there's nothing, it, you know, it, 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 it's a simple agenda, right? It's like, agree with us or we're going to fuck you up. Like, period. Like, like if you don't agree with us, we're going to uh, make things up about you. We're going to attack you. We're going to try to put dirt on your name. Do whatever we got to do because it's all about a bullying kind of thing. It's it's like, like that, there is no room for that open dialogue that you refer to. And I think, and so so I, what I decided, man, was that it's it's just like it is what it is. Like, I don't care who you're having sex with. I just want everybody here to know right now, point blank period, you can ask, get mad at me if you want, but but the same way I'm not gonna go out and announce that I like black women with big booties, I don't need you to announce to me that you wanna sleep with a man, a, a frog, uh, or, or, or three people at once. That's, to me, I always felt like that was a personal thing. And it's very weird to me when somebody walks up and says, I sleep with men and I need, and, and I need you to tell me that that's a good thing. I, I don't care. You know, it, it's, it's, I just think we got to, this whole idea of sexual confessions kind of, kind of. is. It's, is a, it, it, it's a part of the normalization process. If you look at, if you go back to 1972, I believe, when it was officially removed from the DSM and s around the same time, 73, 74, they had the uh, conference or the commission on depopulization. Uh, which was a global thing, but the U.S. was, I think David Rockefeller was over it. And uh, if you look into that, I think it's the NSSM 200 and the NSSM 2000, you look at the need, the, the study that has, says there's a need for depopulization, and then there are the methods. And there was sterilization, there was war, there was all these things, and the homosexual agenda was a part of it. Uh, as a general rule, homosexuals will not reproduce. Now, obviously, they've evolved and they've become a lot more complex in the way they move in their communities. So they are able to continue moving forward in a number of different ways. I've seen uh, people in the community who identify as men who are actually women come out of that long enough to bear a child and give birth and then go back to being that. And so they're in survival mode in a number of different ways. And like, you're right. Like I said, I, they come come at me before and, you know, I prepare for, you know, the moment I said, I'm gonna talk about it, I already knew, uh, but I, what I want to do for the people who actually care about the conversation. Uh, you said, like you said, you, 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 your uh, channel is about people who think. Uh, and so my thing is, there is a r real need for space. And I want to say that first, there's a real need for space for people in the community. Uh, I don't believe in harming people because you disagree with what they're doing. I do believe in open, being open and transparent in how you live in your life with someone who is still functioning from a perspective of, you know, if you were a man at birth, you're a man now. If you're a woman at birth, you're a woman now. That person needs to know it. Now, if you get a person like Malik Yoba who says I'm trans attracted, you know, I like, you know, what they call cis women, and you know, I like if if you look like a woman and I find you beautiful, I'm good with it. Okay. Now that person, you obviously don't have to say anything to because they are they're ready to run the gamut. They're re but but I believe that you have to do that, and I do believe that that is part of the problem. I also believe hatred is a part of the problem. I believe that when we don't when we see someone that doesn't think like us, that don't move like us, that don't hold the same values, we have been trained to be very, very hostile to that, towards that as a means of protecting our own uh, space, our own values and interests and principles. And it makes it very difficult to coexist. And there are a bunch of things along that line, but yeah, it's gonna be uh, the hardliners in that, in that community are gonna come and then they're gonna ignite things. I have a, a, a partnership with, um, a young lady where we set up and we, we promote businesses, we help businesses write their plans and all that stuff. And we have about close to 70,000 followers on Facebook on our page, uh, Black Business Owners uh, Network. And I posted one thing about 
the force, the, uh, the force and the push and the agenda to emasculate black men. And literally, she said, have you checked the page lately? I said, no, I haven't seen it because she pretty much manages it. I, I produce content, but uh, she manages all of the administrative stuff on it. She said, you might want to go look at your last post. And they were going in. There were people saying, I'm getting off. I mean, and it was one person that got it and took it to the masses. And people who didn't belong on the page were showing up and giving their input. So it is what it is as far as that concerned. Yeah, well, you know, that, that ha I, I've seen that happen, you know, I, I, and that's what it is. It's sort of like um, uh, I found that 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 people of a specific ideology run impacts, uh, particularly those who are just pissed off and bitter and negative or whatever and, and extremists, you know. So uh, so, for example, um, you know, I propose I happened to propose to my fiance and I, it was recorded and I, I threw it up on YouTube because I said I, I believe in black love and I love black women. So I think I think I felt like the community. I felt like I could benefit the community by showing a black man getting on a knee and honoring a black woman. That, that was my agenda, right? I had an agenda, y'all, just in case you want to know if I had it. Everybody got an agenda. That's mine. And um, and uh, and I and then we the, the next day, the video had a hundred and something thousand views. And a lot of the views were just, you know, congratulations. This is great. But then there were a lot of people in there that had almost shaped a conspiracy theory about, you know, this is fake. He, you know, she doesn't even like him and da, da, da. And uh, and I, I thought that was fat. And then what happened was a lot of the comments were exactly the same. They like they you know they, they sort of this group thing. Like everybody was saying the exact same thing. And uh, and then my manager came back and said, Yeah, well you know Lipstick Alley they shared your video. And the first person said this video looks fake. It looks like she he ain't really proposing to her. And everybody ran with that same narrative. And it's <clears throat> and so you have basically uh, like, I don't know, they, they'd be troll farms or just like trolling is an industry now, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so ultimately, I think what you got hit, you just got hit by a swarm of trolls. You know, that happened to me. I had a bunch of feminists that did the same thing once where, you know, I made one little comment and they all came in. And what was fascinating was that, again, all the comments were the same. I was like, this is really interesting. Like, these are not independent thinking people. These are people that are just repeating after each other. And, uh, and 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 I th but I think part of my heart goes out to the individuals like that though because maybe the reason reason they gather uh, in that way is because they're hurting they feel uh, rejected by society they feel like they're not getting the respect they deserve and so so you want to hear it out but uh, but but at the same time it becomes it becomes a huge threat to freedom freedom of speech democracy all these things you know like like you see what they're doing to Dave Chappelle now now let me ask you this uh Dr. Wallace by the way I'm speaking to Mr. Rick Wallace we're talking about Malik Yoba and everything else uh hit the thumbs up button if you haven't done that and Rick is going to be at the all-black national convention in Houston if you want to meet him in person along with Jade Arendelle and, and everybody else uh go to allblacknationalconvention.com if you want to get a pass so Rick let me ask you this man I, I, the Dave Chappelle thing I thought the Dave Chappelle uh conversation or all of that was a breath of fresh air not because I agree but because I, I was I'm happy when somebody says what's really on their mind as opposed to trying to fit in this this false box of political correctness. What were your thoughts on Dave Chappelle's uh, skit, and, uh, his, his whole routine, Sticks and Stones, if you happen to see any of it? Uh, and, uh, and, and what do you think that that kind of does for the conversation? First of all, it was brilliant. Uh, the brilliant in the writing, brilliant in, uh, in the delivery, and challenging. And so from that perspective, he has cemented himself, as far as I'm concerned, as the one of the best who's ever done it, uh, because the brilliance of what he delivers and delivering the truth. And the thing is, you got to understand his history and you got to understand just how transparent that was. Although it was very subtle in, in its brilliance, it was very, very accurate and uncomfortable for a certain group of people. And those people happen to belong to a smaller subsect of people who control the power. And so it made white people uncomfortable. Um, and it, it showed up immediately. The thing is, at some point, you're, go you're going to be called out on your mess. Your receipts are going to be pulled. And all of us have receipts that we don't necessarily want to talk about. We don't want pulled. But when your receipts go back 400 years and somebody does it in a way that has people laughing at the situation, but also saying, I didn't know that, or I never thought about it that way, man, he's got a point. Now, if it was just people laughing because it sounded stupid and funny, this wouldn't be a problem. 
he, he literally triggered critical thought through laughter, through comedy. And now he's a threat. He's been a threat. You got to remember, he's one of the few people who are in Hollywood who refused to put a dress on, a few black men who refused to put a dress on and, was, and walked away from, I think, what, a $50 million contract at the time and moved to Africa. Uh, when he had the Dave Chappelle show, he was ran up with a $50,000 contract and he was doing the show with Martin, I forgot wherever Martin was, the, the criminal pretending to be a detective. And they got this scene in the store where he's, he's a crackhead now. He's a former partner, a stick up kid, but now he's lost it and he's on bad luck. He's trying to rob a store. Martin goes in, talks him down, but it's a part where they want him to put a dress on. And they start trying to convince him, hey, you know, Martin's done it and they're naming all the people who've, who've done it. And he said, well, that means it doesn't need to be done again. I don't want to do it. And, 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 and so what happened is um, ultimately, that person, I guess, who was a show producer, uh, went out and the director came in and the director tried to talk him into it. And the more people were trying to put pressure on him, he felt it was something more to it than just trying to get me an address. And he came alive. Wait a minute. That's how they're disempowering black men. Because there's an emasculation that goes along with that image. And when you consistently uh, portray a black man in an emasculate way, it takes away from his masculine expression. And so they knew that, most people don't, but they understand the power of propaganda. They understand what we present has power. You, we, we, we'll give you access, but we're gonna emasculate you in the process so that you do what we want you to do and that no one takes you seriously. Because what I learned in watching our people specifically is that while black women will befriend gay men, and have gay friends, they won't follow them. Mm. You never see a gay man, or openly gay man, out leading. They'll friend you and they'll everything, but when it's saying, hey, look, we moving forward, we're changing things, we're shifting, they want a man that they can look at and see someplace they can hide and be protected. And on that note, I want to, uh, first of all, commend you for the way that you did do that with your fiance. Those who are from my channel know I celebrate my wife all the time. Uh, I worked hard to prepare myself for her uh, and I do everything I can to protect her, to nurture her, to care for her. And I do it a lot. And it actually is, a, uh, I mean, and they love my wife on my channel. It's like, hey, when is she coming back? It's hard getting her on because she's the opposite of me. I can get in front of a camera and go for days. It's like sticking her with pins to get her in front of a, a video camera. <laughs> but they are demanding her because they heard so much about her. And then when they met her, they found out he wasn't lying. She's on that. She's a, she's an author. Uh, she is a childhood sexual abuse and rape uh, survivor. Uh, how I met her is I counseled her. And then we broke our professional ties. She went her way. I went my way. She came back about a year. We started talking and I had spent a year with her. So I knew who she was as a person. We never dated. When she came back, we talked on the phone a couple of weeks and I say, I want to marry you. We got married, been married ever since. Uh, I'm about character and commitment because I can say I'm dating you for a year and I get to know you. The person you're going to be three years from now is the person I got, I, I, is not going to be the person I just got to know. Mm -hmm. So if, so what I have to do is understand marriage. So marriage to me is first and foremost, a commitment between two people who have similar ag agendas or visions and then you make it work because you can be clicking in the beginning. And we've all been there where we just click with somebody. It was off the chain. It was hot. Two or three years later, you're looking at them and I can't stand them. And, and it, you grew two different ways and you didn't understand that the, the marriage had to be bigger than the individual. Mm -hmm. And so I commend you because that's to me something that needs to be out there. And the reason I do it is because I want people to know that it can be done because there's this big push to create the gap between the black man and the black woman. Uh, and so I want people to know that you can stand together and you can even have some philosophical differences, but if you have the same agenda and you're heading in the same way, you can make it work. So I commend you for that. Well, I, I, I agree with you, man. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I, the, the, the whole agenda to emasculate is, uh, you know, I mean, it's consistent. I mean, right, if you look at the history, you just see all the efforts to uh, in, to neutralize the threat, you know, the, the, the masculine black male is seen as a threat and you go to Hollywood and Hollywood 
Uh, I have I have my students read the book How the Jews Invented Hollywood, not in not in any sort of anti-Semitic way, but in a way to say, you know, here's how you build an empire uh, when you when you're dealing with oppression. Here's how you build an empire that fights back on the oppression. Uh, so I admire what they did with Hollywood, but at the same time, I want them to understand the you know the 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 darker aspect of that in the sense that you know there was always an agenda. There's an agenda first to control the way the world sees you. And then you get to control how other people are seen, and, you know, because you control media. You know, right. it's, it's not a coincidence. You look at New York Times and all these cable networks, Viacom, which you know runs BET and all these other networks that that are that all get rooted to this community that's only about two and a half, three percent of the population. But they their tentacles are just everywhere, and right. and it's not again. This is not even you don't, you don't have to be anti-Semitic to say any of this. Not I would never want to be, but it's it's just reality, right? And, and it says to black people. Uh, you want to be strategic in controlling the message about your own people, because if you don't control it, somebody else will. Uh, now, let me tell everybody who you are uh, real quick, brother. So they, so they uh, pull, we move to the next topic, because I'm going to ask you another question in one second. Uh, okay. I'm with Mr. Rick Wallace. Uh, Rick is, um, as you as you know, he's a very knowledgeable man. I see you guys in the chat. I really like what he has to say. He's a very smart brother. He's going to be at the All Black National Convention. Uh, he's going to be one of our panelists uh, there. We have a long list of people that are going to be there, everybody from uh, from Willie D from the Ghetto Boys to Dr. George C. Frazier, Vicki Dillard from Fly New Being Queen, Jade Arendelle from Fly New Being Queen. A lot of really smart black folks um, that are going to be there uh, discussing solutions, uh, issues and topics and, and things that matter in our community, everything from love and relationships to politics, and of course, economics and, and investing and things like that. There'll be training sessions on on investing. Uh, Julian Gordon, a real estate expert, is going to be there as well. So there's going to be a lot of great people there. Uh, if you want to learn more, go to allblacknationalconvention.com. That's allblacknationalconvention.com. In fact, uh, speaking of real estate, uh, I actually just got a confirmation that Constance Carter, who runs the largest black-owned real estate firm in California, is going to be there. Uh, and I'll go down the list real quick for you guys. Uh, Danielle Pierce, who's a wealth expert. Uh, Ronique West. Uh, Noma Langamushali Moses, who you guys have seen here, Sharif Abdul Malik, uh, creator of We Buy Black, uh, Michael Emotep from the African History Network, Dr. Ron Daniels. Uh, so the list goes on. Uh, you won't regret it. You're going to love it. And uh, and then just from hearing Rick, I'm sure you guys, uh, if you like, if you like what Rick has to say, just just say something in the chat to let this brother know how much you appreciate uh, his, his intellect. Uh, so please hit the thumbs up button. Hit the thumbs up, share, and subscribe button. Also, uh, if you haven't hit the notification bell to be notified when we go live. Hit that bell right now. Hit the bell right now so you'll be notified every time we go live. And, uh, and now let's jump back into the conversation. So so let me ask you about this, brother. It seems to me that, you know, when you talk about, you know, these these issues like the Malik Yoba issues um, and, and people say, well, you know, some of this don't add up or well, I live in Atlanta and this is what I'm seeing, but they're telling me it's something different. Or my, my cousin went to prison and and I think that affected his sexual behavior, right? Because we know prison is such a horribly dysfunctional place that that you know it just creates all kinds of um, issues, right? Uh, and, you know, it seems to me like there's almost like a blockade from even exploring these possibilities, or or doing the research, or even having um, a black conversation about uh, sexual choices and orientation, where you sort of process all the things we go through as black people. You know, everything from prison to child abuse and things like that. People don't want to talk about that. They say, oh, well, well if, you, if, you, if you're gay, you're just gay. Like, they don't, don't, add, don't, don't talk about these other things. They have nothing to do with it. It's just a preference. And, and, and that's why we're going to talk about it in kindergarten, you know, or whatever, you know. And, and why do you think that there's such a block in terms of really trying to really look for honesty and truth in this discussion, as opposed to just pursuing some sort of agenda that's being forced onto the people? I actually think that that blockage that you talk about is real, first of all, and I believe it's coming from two primary perspectives. Uh, first, I'll talk about the least uh, forceful or less potent perspective, and that is Blacks in general. A lot of us have, from early in life, had a certain view of the homosexual community, uh, especially those of us that were born before 1975. Uh, we have a certain view of it. You know, even if we were children at the point of at the time of 1975, there was a perception. It wasn't necessarily a hostile perception. It was just okay. That's not something you 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 do, or if you do, you keep it to yourself. And it was pretty much that way. Uh, again, growing up in the church, I saw it a lot because that seemed to be a hub, and so I saw it. But what happens with the people like us who 
see it, we see the discussions about, about, about what might be the origins of it. And I'm, I'm a person who believes in the seven universal laws. So one is cause and effect. I don't believe you get a result without there being a cause. I don't believe in coincidence. So uh, when you start to talk about it, there's a part of the group that says, that's just looking for an excuse. And so we don't want to talk about it. It is what it is. You either are, you are, don't, don't tell me. And we will like that about a lot of things. But when it comes to this, we don't want to give it any reason to exist because we deep down inside don't want it to exist. And by doing that, we actually solidify their argument that they're invisible, that they're not acknowledged, that they don't uh, fit in as a part of the population. Uh, on the other side is the potent side. It's the power side. It's power plays. It's a 40 plus year, almost 50 year agenda. And it's the LGBTQ community that's saying, no, it's not that, it's not this. We simply have discovered inside of ourselves that we weren't who we were told we were. And there's no there's no reason to talk. Because see, then if you start to talk about it, then it start, if you start to talk about uh, environment, if you start to talk about genetic predisposition, if you start to talk about uh, childhood sexual abuse, molestation, rape, incest, all of these other influencing factors that seem to be highly prevalent when you start to discuss this topic, then you start to push it back into the realm of mental illness, back towards being in the DSM, and that is not where they want it to go. They don't want to discuss it. And the thing is, where I stand is, let's not discuss it with a bias. Let's not discuss it with a bias on your end. Let's not discuss it with a bias on my end. Let's discuss it and see what we come up with so that we are making sure that, my whole thing is, I don't give a rat's butt about being politically correct. So I'm never about, I'm about being human, first of all. I'm not out to hurt anybody. I'm not out to hate anybody. I am out to protect my people. So everything I fight for is lined up with the agenda of collective progression for Black people, not the anomaly. See, what they'll do is they'll use people like yourself, maybe even people like me, and definitely those who are, you know, the Jay-Zs and all these that have got all the money. And they'll say, well, if they made it, you know, the whole pull yourself up by your bootstrap thing, then why can't you make it? And what they won't acknowledge is even the best net will miss some people. And then uh, not realize that the talented 10th was snatched out of the mist anyway, for the most, for the most part, using the talented 10th to uh, push back in the face of the 90, when the talented 10th was literally there to pull the 90 forward. So they created a divide there, but in essence, when I look at this whole thing, I want to sit down and look at it and say, hey, let's come up with a, a solution of understanding this so that we can deal with it from a, a place of reality. But what I can't stand, and my hostility as it, it, as it pertains to the LGT, some of them letters, as it pertains to that is not that you exist because I'm not perfect. Uh, if I'm looking at this at, at, at that as being imperfect, I'm not perfect. So you can come into my life and find a bunch of things that you probably don't like and that probably aren't socially acceptable. Okay, so that that's that. My problem is you're doing to me what you've been complaining about people doing to you. You're trying to bully me and force me in to not only accepting you, but riding with you. I have the right to sit up and say, I love you, but I ain't good with it. Do you? And if you left it at that, me and you don't have nothing to talk about. I'm not, I don't pop up on my, 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 my channel or on my posts or in my books talking about, we got to shut these gays down. We get, that's not my, that's not, my thing is stop bullying. Stop trying to force people to see it your way. If you want to sit at the table and talk about it, you got to come with a non-biased uh, perspective. And if you're not coming with a non-biased perspective, you can't even, you being, a, you, you holding a doctorate, no that you can't introduce your uh, your bias into your research. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so- I, I, I think it's a good point. I mean, I, I you know, I think that, um, you know, and I get, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see what the long-term fallout is, right? Um, you know, I, I guess every movement has a backlash, but um, I feel that, you know, when I think back to when Obama was named by Newsweek as the first gay president, because he did so much to advance the agenda, um, I think that there was um, a bitterness, I think there was a resentment uh, from a big chunk of the country that felt that the Democratic Party had gone just so far to the left, you know, and, and to the point where they were demonizing 
you know, good people. They, they didn't do anything to anybody. You know, like like my mama goes to church uh, several times a week, you know, and uh, and she got pissed off because she she said, why are people calling us homophobic just because I believe what's in my Bible? We know we know there's gay people in the church. <laughs> we don't mess with them. You know, they don't mess with us. We Everybody loves each other. You know, I just can't agree because of something I believe in already, you know. Right. And, and but yet there was this whole conversation. Black people are homophobic, the, you know, the, you know, whatever. And and, and, and and I think a lot of people were very upset about that. And I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to say this point blank. I know black people who voted for Trump just because they said I'm not supporting all that agenda that they forced on me anymore. You know, <clears throat> and so I believe that, you know, so when people try to talk about well, where did Trump come from? How did he get all this power? I'm kind of like, well, I, I think that you that you might have contributed to that by ignoring so many people in exchange for sort of believing that because you are part of the liberal elite and you've got all this power, you got some all these media outlets that you can shape the narrative and shape the thinking, just force that on people. You know, right. uh, what, what what are your thoughts on that, bro? No, I, I I totally agree. And here here's the scary thing about the Trump statement that you made. If nothing changes, dude's coming back for a second term. As we're looking now, if nothing changes, the Democrats have not done anything to present someone that can present a new reality that is better than what they brought to the table the last time. They're still thinking they can run on, we're not as bad as him. Yeah. And what they don't get is people, when they voted for him, all the stuff that we talk about that he does, he was doing it and had, had been brought out on it. The whole way he talks about women, that was brought out before the election and he was voted in predominantly by white women. So you're not going to convince them that this isn't the guy when you don't have a person that's totally different than anything they've seen before. And you're gonna to have to address some topics that are on the table that have never been addressed before. And, and, and status quo is not gonna do it for the Democrats. The lesser of two evils doesn't work for this generation. And, tr and tr what, made, what made Trump to me very, uh, very inf uh, influential in the entire political scope and very few pe people have paid attention to it. He showed that you don't have to have a black, black. I mean, a black block vote to win the presidency. Mm. He showed that you don't have to go out and pursue blacks, and uh, you're going to get some, but the vast majority are not, and you still do it. What he pandered to was fear, mm -hmm. fear and anger. And what you're talking about now is the reason he probably will have, with all the stuff that black people say, and you can go up and down social media, and they ripping, dude. They giving him the business. But he's going to have more black people vote for him this time than last time because of issues and topics like this. Traditionally, we've been stretched so far out of our comfort zone by the Democrats. And not just with their dealing with the gay agenda, but starting there. And... I mean, when I go back and I look at Barack Obama, I can't think of one thing where I look up and say, okay, he made a move for us. But every time I turn around, he was making a move for them. Mm. And I'm saying, okay, let's go look. And so we start, you know, we started researching all of the, uh, the uh, executive orders and the executive momentum, uh, memos that he was, he was uh, writing and signing. I'm like, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Something my great grandma, I was reared by my great grandfather, by the way, born in 1909. So I was reared by my grandmother's father and, 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 my, and, and, and my great grandmother. And so you tell me, son, just cause he's smiling in your face and he look like you don't mean that he for you. You gotta play the game a little smarter than that. There gonna be some people that don't look like you that'll hold you down much better than some of those that do. So you gotta judge behaviors. And so when I looked at him, the behavior didn't add up. Mm -hmm. And it also caused, a, his, his presidency also caused a lot of black people who were on edge and on guard to put their guard down. Racism has to be over, right? We have a black president. Well, not when you go back and you study all the way back into the early 80s and find out that he's been picked mm -hmm. and literally groomed for this from the time he got into college and the connections uh, that uh, his mom's side of the family had to some government agencies like the CIA and other things like that, 
his his mom's uh, brother, if I'm not mistaken, his mom's brother or father, I think it's his, his, his father, father mm -hmm. showed up to his, uh, who was in the CIA, shows up to his room his freshman year in college. And then his connection with Bozignu Brzezinski, who set up the trilateral commission and how that played out, uh, it, it lets you know that when they decide they want somebody in, they're going in. Uh, that's the whole reason that the Electoral College was created. Now, the way that it was worded, if I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, is in the case that the people can't make the right choice. <laughs> so basically, we don't try to convince y'all to vote it in because if the people feel they voted in, you still have the confidence in the system. And that's what I tell people all the time. Voting isn't simply, especially on a national level, isn't so much about electing officials as them taking a litmus test as to where you stand as a nation in supporting and believing in the system. Because see, when people stop voting, that tells you they don't believe it anymore. And normally revolution comes shortly thereafter. Mm. And so as long as we can convince y'all to come vote, y'all still believe y'all vote counts. And in certain ways it does. I'm not telling people that you don't vote. I'm saying that if it's that valuable, you spend it on something worth voting on. It's the same way we spend our money. We spend our money on things that are valuable it's like, if we got it, we've got to spend it. No, you've got to spend it on something that's going to bring you value, something that appreciates. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and if you're not spending it on something you appreciate, that, what separates the consumer from the investor is not spending money is what you spend it on. Mm -hmm. that's right. And so, so that's the thing. I'm not going to go out and vote for anybody in the Democratic Party solely because they're not him. I'm not voting for him either. But I'm not going to go out and vote for anybody that I see that doesn't address specifically what I'm concerned about. I'm going to, I'm going to have to see policies and agendas, something I can hold you to, so that when the next time comes around, if you ain't follow through, I can, I can put, I can put the X on you, and I'm not going to vote for you. So that's how you start holding uh, politicians accountable. But yeah, this, this, this entire thing is like, he's definitely a shoe in from where he sits right now. And, and then as, as dumb as he makes himself appear, he's playing it smart. And I'm pretty sure he has people in his corner, but you gotta understand, while he was birthed into money, he's played a couple of things smart that I've looked at. The fact that he's gonna probably end up paying half of what he initially financed to build Trump Towers through uh, financial restructuring, through uh, filing bankruptcy. Because every time he files, I think he's done it like three times so far. He files, he restructures, reorganizes the debt, lowers the debt in an in a, in a, in a, uh, agreement, then comes back. That part that he got negotiated off, he doesn't have to pay that he initially had to pay. He's going to get it for half the price. Most people are going to say he's a poor businessman because he filed bankruptcy. No, that's how they end up keeping their money and getting stuff for less mm -hmm. while we don't figure the things out. And it's just about stuff like that. But even with his moves, uh, where everybody's about to lose their mind with this trade war with China. Uh, if, if you understand, and I know you do way better than I do, but there's a positive side to this. It's not going to be pretty for people on the short term, mm -hmm. but you got a lot of stuff. And the re what, what, what people don't understand is you got a big issue in China with them stealing our, 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 our uh, ideas, our technology. Yeah. and stuff like that. We're having stuff made over there. They're taking it and then making it, putting a new name on it. And you really have no way to enforce that. You have no way of saying, okay, I'm gonna sue you because, okay, sue, we don't care. And, and you know, and so you have all these different things. And so there is a lot going on with that. And I just happened to look at him like, okay, what's the angle with this? Because he's picking a fight with it. And the thing is, from a communist perspective, they're, they're gonna play power, but they're built on a house of cards. I don't think, as some experts do, that they're going to ever be the world's next superpower because of the the, the, deck of, the house of cards that they're built on and the fact that the way they control so much. But I think that they're definitely, we're definitely not where we were, and I don't think we're ever going to be back there. Uh, but I, I think that it's going to be less of a monopoly on power moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with you. I, I think... Um... Yeah, I, th I think it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. And you're right, there's a, there's a good and a dark side to the trade war. Anytime there's war, right, there's a loss, but you hope that you gain more than you lose. And, right. you know, and some would argue that war is almost necessary uh, to kind of figure out who should control what. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it's diplomacy by other means. And I think that, um, I, I, I think that uh, the, you know, the big question about Trump is, um, is, 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 
is you know is, is this gonna are the good is the good gonna outweigh the bad you know when it comes right. to China and uh, and I think that the Chinese you're right they do live on the house of cards um if you look at their history they've had periods of political instability and I believe that a lot of this stability now is hinged upon this this massive economic growth so by Trump sort of threatening that um it's sort of undermining their geopolitical uh, influence you know around right. the world they 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 they're they're good at using their money to control people and right. so when you see like uh it is it's so it's an interesting chess game like for example i have no doubt that that we play some role in in, in every all the chaos in hong kong right now you know like okay. I, you know like like i like i know that we are in there somewhere right we doing what the russians did to us and that's what everybody does everybody's trying to mess up everybody else's house so right. uh, it's gonna be interesting to see how it plays out, man. So let me ask you a final question, brother. By the way, I want everybody to know I'm speaking to um, uh, Rick Wallace, Dr. Rick Wallace. He is a uh, uh, he, well, he's a smart guy. He knows a lot of things uh, about psychology and, and and as well as many other areas. And uh, he's actually coming to the All Black National Convention. Uh, this is my first time speaking to the brother. Won't be my last time. Uh, and I uh, hope you guys will do this for me. Please uh, hit the thumbs up button right now if you haven't done that. Uh, please hit the share subscribe button. Uh, hello to everybody on Instagram. Uh, the Instagram is the Real Voice Watkins. If you're on YouTube, hit that notification bell so you'll be notified when we go live. Uh, also, if you want to come to the All Black National Convention the weekend of September 27th, go to allblacknationalconvention.com. That's allblacknationalconvention.com. Also, this weekend, actually today, this afternoon, I'm speaking at the Diverse Entrepreneurship Summit here in Louisville, Kentucky. You can go to drboysloyville.com if you'd like to get tickets, drboysloyville.com. So let me ask you this, man, just uh, in terms of just a you know, final closing thought, uh, you know, circling back to the whole, you know, Malik Yoba conversation. Um, you know, I, I think that, I'll tell you, man, I, I, I'll confess. I, I sometimes I, I was talking to uh, my mother yesterday, actually. I talked to my mother as much as possible because I, I, you know, I just believe in giving people their flowers while they're here. So I, I, I make I make it a point to talk to, you know, my elders as much as I can just to let them know how much I love them. You know, I'm not going to just be crying at your funeral. I'm going to let you know how I feel about you now. So my mother and I are talking and we talk about all kinds of stuff and, you know, whatever. But but one thing that we discussed was um, why people die and why death just makes sense, why death is necessary. So I, I told her, I said, you know, when I think about my brother's daughter, who, who's my niece, uh, I said, OK, so she's born in 2019. So that means that if she has her first child at 30, she'll have her first child in 2049. And then if that child has their first child, let's say at 30, then that child has a child in 2079. And so I said, okay, so that's that would be uh, my brother's grandchild and then great grandchild. And that child will get to see the 20, the, the 22nd century, right? So I'm, I'm visualizing that. And I said, what if they invented uh, a drug that allowed us to live, you know, to the year 2079, to the, you know, to, or to the year 2100? You know, like, like, how would I fit in that world? And I told my mother, I said, I don't think I'd want to live that long because I would be a dinosaur. Like I, I, I would literally the way I view the world would be so different from everybody else. And it made me start thinking about people like my grandfather, who's 92. And I, I'm like, how in the world can you feel normal? In, you know, in this world, when you grew up in his world where everything was so different and the ideas are constantly changing, they're going to keep on changing. And they'll be doing shit in twenty in, in the year twenty one hundred that most of us cannot even relate to on any level. We're gonna think it's just flat out crazy. And right. So, so I guess the thought is, you know, how do we how do we balance between being open minded and and, and and accepting change without just signing off for any crazy thing anybody brings along? Uh, because I, I, I'll tell you, man, this whole com- all these conversations about sexuality and gender and everything else. It's confusing people. I don't know. Give me a yes or no, guys, if you know what I'm talking about. They, did you see that the other day, man, where they somebody came out and said that there were a hundred different genders? And I'm just like, what the fuck is that? Like, I don't understand. Uh, but, Give me but, that. Well, to answer the question, you know, how do you evolve? Like I said, I don't, I don't think I want to live that long. Uh, matter of fact, I know I don't. Uh, <laughs> how, do, how do you uh, adjust to that. How do you determine what what's acceptable, what's not acceptable? I call it character and evolution. Uh, you're going to have to evolve in how things are done. You're going to have to evolve in how things are presented, but you don't have to evolve in your standards and what you declare is right for you. You don't have to evolve in that. You just you have to evolve. For instance, uh, my 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 standard says that I need your standard says you need your mom so many times a week. Now, over time, that's changed how you do it. 
you know, it's, especially if she's, you know, somebody that's up on it. And you, you, you've went from calling on a, a landline to calling on a analog cell phone to calling on a, a digital cell phone to probably FaceTiming. And that's changed, but it's still the same standard. So that's the first part. And so you, that, that, that's the part of it. Another thing to me is uh, I believe in uh, the spiritual nature. I believe that the closer you become in oneness with the most high and however you see it, I don't tell people what to believe. I don't say you got to be a Christian, you got to be a Muslim, you got to be Buddhist or whatever. I'm saying that there's a connectivity and a higher level of consciousness. And the way that I view it is that this consciousness exists everywhere, knows everything, and is there. And when you are in tune with the most high, you don't have to have, that's where the ammunitions of Mayat came from. Before there was ever the Ten Commandments that said, thou shall not, there were the ammunitions of Mayat that says, I have not, because I already knew I wasn't supposed to, so I, I, I have not. And so the way that happens is this direct connectivity with, with the most high, with God to where I don't have to ask or have rules or protocols in place to tell me this isn't something I need to do. There's something inside of you planted in each person that the more you clean yourself, the more you detoxify, the more you're able to commune on this high level of consciousness and you simply know this ain't for me. I can't stay, I can't roll with that. I know it's the trend. I know everybody on it, but I can't roll with it and be okay with it. I don't, I'm not here to tell you not to roll with it. I'm just not gonna roll with it. And sometimes you'll feel the need to explain yourself. Sometimes you just simply say, that's not for me. My spirit doesn't allow it and be okay with it. But I do believe that that's where we stand because character is a, a character in evolution is simply saying, I have a standard by which I'm going to live my life. And it's a standard built on my, my, my focus and my understanding of what's, what's necessary and what's needed. And I don't need to align it with anyone else. This is who I am. And I can evolve in how I live it based on technology. And I'm gonna say this and I'll be done. I can't remember who said it, but at the beginning of the turning of this century, uh, that was a, a, a philosopher, a, a great mind and thinker. Somebody is just not, not coming to me. Uh, but they said that in the past, illiteracy was the inability to read or write. But it, moving forward in the future, illiteracy will be the inability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And what it was addressing was the rapid pace of technology. With you being so prevalent on uh, social media, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What worked in an organic uh, mechanism of attracting followers two years ago doesn't work anymore. The algorithms are shifting. They are creating more ways to call you in and make you pay for what you could have got organically and free two years ago. And that's how fast it's changing. What work, man, if you go back in business, I've been in business for a long time. So the traditional marketing model, you can't even recognize it in today's marketing model. Almost all of the Fortune 500 have totally flipped upside down their marketing spends and their ad budgets. And it's all in social media now, not television. Now you still have a lot in television, but compare, everybody's on Facebook, everybody's engaging, uh, everybody's, you know, depending on what you what you focus on, whether it's branding, whatever, Instagram is blowing up uh, and it's unbelievable in that way. So the same thing is happening in every other aspects. How we communicate with, the, with each other is changing. Uh, some for the good, some for the bad. I think that the personal direct engagement of looking face to face is something that's lacking and it's showing up in our personal behaviors. It's making us more callous, but, all, but at the same point, now I can talk to anybody anywhere in the world and there's not even an international charge anymore. Mm, I like that. And so it's, it's, it's unbelievable, but yes, uh, moving forward, that's something that we've got to be aware of. We got to be aware of that things are going to change, but standards don't. All right. Uh, well, uh, uh, everybody, this is uh, Rick Wallace. Rick is um, uh, a uh, very smart brother, as you guys can tell. And uh, he is going to be at the All Black National Convention in Houston the weekend of September 27th. So if you are Black every single day of the week and twice on Sundays, then you should go to allblacknationalconvention.com and come out because we are going to have a great weekend, uh, lots of learning, lots of great conversations. And, uh, and, and uh, hit the thumbs up button, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, hit that bell so you'll be notified when we go live. Uh, so last but not least, Rick, I'm going I'm to end this conversation between two uh two educated brothers by asking you a very ignorant question. And I want everybody to give me a yes or no on this. 
Malik Yoba famously said, uh, I'm not gay. I, I just like women with with breasts and penises. So yes or no, does that mean he's gay or 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 not? What do you guys think? What what do you think, Rick? I, I'm sure you have a more nuanced answer, but but I'd be but curious. Straight what, forward, that straight gay, forward. Right? I can't I can't buy it. So <laughs> you know, if you're asking me if that's that that's homosexual behavior, I have to say yes. Really? Yes, okay. I, I'm gonna look at, uh, I'll let you know what the comments are. Let me see. I see. <laughs> I see a lot of yeses. <laughs> I, I have not. I have not seen a no yet. Okay, wait, wait. Every 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 says no. Okay, good, good. It's it's okay. The diversity perspective is great. Right. I just when I heard that, I'm not, I, I'm not saying I'm right because again, that's something that's evolving in definition. Uh, because a lot of those definitions that were given in that interview were definitely different than the uh, definitions that I grew up with of what what is and what is, and so it totally changes the dialogue because based on what they're saying, he's not gay because he's attracted to a, a, ter- a certain image. Because it looks like a woman, that makes him not gay, despite the fact that uh, genetically they are a male. So, you know, it, it, that, 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 I guess you can call it perspective. Uh, but if I had to answer that question, I would say, uh, from where I'm sitting, that that would consider to be considered to me to be uh, homosexual. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, because if 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 you are a gay man who has a boyfriend and tell and you want the boyfriend to be feminine, right? You have, you know, because we know they have. I'm not dissing. It just is what it is, right? You're mm-hmm. still gay. You just you just want a feminine, you know, you know. And, and the gender role thing, I, I at least from what I've seen, I'm, I'm not even gonna pretend like I'm an expert on none of this, but 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 it seems that, that sometimes you do see these gender roles emerging, you know, and uh, you know, because I, I have people in my family that you know, a part of that community. So I show that respect. And sometimes I'll just ask those ignorant old uncle questions like, okay, can you explain this thing to me? Because I really want to understand. It's not because I'm trying to be mean. I would never be mean to them because I love them. But it's like, so why did this happen this way? And what usually happens? Is, and, and they and they school me on it. And, and I like that that safe space to be able to ask those questions without being accused of anything. Right. I, I think that's extremely important that they also understand that, that you're going to have people who are deeply embedded in their beliefs and how they view things. And so if you are expecting them to come at you the way you see you, it's gonna always be conflict. You gotta, just like you want people to give you space, you're gonna have to give people space. And then you create the dialogue in the space. Mm. All right, well, well, I love it, man. Well, you know what? Uh, this has been a very pleasant conversation. Um, I appreciate you sharing your brilliant mind with us, man. Uh, everybody. Uh, once again, uh, uh, I want everybody to uh, go go look up, look him up, Mr. Rick Wallace. Uh, he is a uh, very smart brother. He has a very great, U- a very good YouTube channel. I've seen the channel myself, and also his website. I'm gonna give you guys a website. Uh, it's um, is it the Odyssey Project top? Is that correct? No, the Odyssey Project twenty one dot top. Dot twenty. Okay, the Odyssey Project twenty one dot top. I didn't I didn't know that dot top was a um was a uh, an extension but they they got so many of them now it's like right, it's like, yeah. it, like genders right we got a hundred yeah. genders and a hundred extensions all right. right so the odyssey project 21.top uh that's where you can go follow up on on his uh his his work and uh you can also see him at the all black national convention and i look forward to meeting you there myself brother uh thank you very much for your time uh it, it's been an absolute pleasure thanks for having me absolutely all right everybody take uh you guys have a great day hit the thumbs up button before you go uh, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you'll know when we go live. And uh, you guys have a great day. We love you, and uh, we will see you soon. Take care. Peace.